Welcome to the Fully Live Well webinar, Recreational Activities and Travel with Linda Walls, Occupational Therapist and Programs Consultant for CanDo MS. My name is Scott Klein, Programs Coordinator at CanDo MS. Live Fully Live Well is a wellness program for people with MS and their support partners. Managing your health and wellness is an integral part of living well with MS. Live Fully Live Well is a comprehensive program from Can Do MS and the National MS Society designed for people with MS and their support partners. Live Fully Live Well cover to covers topics affecting the whole family living with MS in order to strengthen relationships, increase understanding, and promote improved health and quality of life for the person with MS and their support partner. This program helps people living with MS and their support partners move from education to action. There are three aspects to this program, six one-day in-person programs around the country, seven web-based videos introducing wellness topics, and 14 webinars covering the seven topics from the web-based videos, which is what you're participating in tonight. All three areas of this program can be integrated together or enjoyed separately to provide you with resources, knowledge, and tools to create a personalized wellness plan. This program is made possible by MS Active Source which is sponsored by Biogen, IDIC, and Elan Pharmaceuticals. As I mentioned before, Live Fully, Live Well is a collaborative program between CanDo MS and the National MS Society. The vision of the National MS Society is a world free of MS. The Society helps people affected with, by MS by funding cutting-edge research, driving change through advocacy, facilitating professional education, and providing programs and services that help people with MS and their families move their lives forward. CanDo MS is an innovative provider of lifestyle empowerment programs for people with MS and their support partners. We are the start of a whole new way of thinking and living with MS. CanDo MS empowers people to be moved beyond their MS by giving them the knowledge, skills, tools, and confidence to adopt a healthy, healthy lifestyle, behaviors, actively co-manage their disease, and live their best lives. So, a few housekeeping items tonight before we get started. Linda will address the questions at the end of the presentation, and we encourage questions and comments throughout the presentation. To ask a question, type your question in the chat feature located on the bo uh, bottom left side of your screen. To submit a question, type in the small box that says chat. Also, many of you submitted questions when you registered, and Linda will address those questions in her presentation tonight. This presentation will be recorded and will be archived on CanDo MS's website. You can view this presentation again or check out other Live Fully Live Well archived webinars. For those of you who are attending live tonight, you will receive an email tomorrow with copies of this PowerPoint presentation. So we have a great speaker lined up tonight. Her name is Linda Walls, and Linda has been a practicing occupational therapist for approximately 25 years with the majority of those years at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Her experience has been in many areas, including neurology, neurosurgery, and trauma. Many of those years have been spent working in inpatient rehabilitation units. Recently, she has been working with children who have fine motor coordination and visual perceptual difficulties. She has been a member of CanDo MS's program staff since 1993. So before we get started, I'm just going to uh, put up a quick survey here to get a feel for who's on the call with us. Um, so I just put up a survey on the screen, and uh, please tell us about yourself. So click on, uh, are you a person living with MS, a support partner, a healthcare professional, or other? And go ahead and start that, and we'll uh, see what the results are. Give it a few moments here. Okay, so looks like about 96, almost 97% are people living with MS, 10.2% um, are support partners, and then 3.3% are others. So that being said, we're going to hand it on over to Linda, and it's all you. Welcome, everybody. Um, our talk tonight is Recreational Activities and Travel. Uh, I'm going to begin tonight first by going over our purpose um, our, and our, just our general guideline for tonight's talk. 
we're going to begin with defining what recreational activities can be. I want to define recreation and then I'll go on to define travel. I'd like to do these de definitions just so that we all start thinking um, about what it is that we're talking about and get them on the same page. Then I'm going to go on to identify the challenges which may limit our participation in recreational activities. Then we'll continue on to how to overcome these challenges by giving you some ideas and resources. And then finally, I'd like to close by making a plan where I will go through um, how I would do it, give you some ideas, questions, so that you can um, actually try to put our ideas into a working plan for you. Let's begin with recreational activities. It's defined as a means of refreshment or diversion. I put a couple pictures just to kind of throw, get your ideas going. But let's be a little more specific. Recreational activities, they provide us an opportunity for pleasure. They provide us time for enjoyment. They provide time to be with family and friends. They also provide a healthy component to help you balance your lifestyle. And though I gave pictures initially of active exercises, maybe camping or walking the dog, there are a lot of other um, activities that also are recreational because as long as they provide pleasure and enjoyment to you, then that's recreational. That's something positive and that's what we want to encourage. Next is travel. Travel can be a part of a recreational activity or it can be the recreational activity in itself. And so I gave an example here of horseback riding. Again, this is an outdoor activity because it was a pretty picture, but again, travel can be a means of getting somewhere or it could be something that we enjoy doing. Again, the idea is to promote something positive and enjoyable for you and, and your family. What recreational activities are in your life? I want everybody to take a minute and think about what do you participate? What's an enjoyable activity? Is it something that you do every week? Is it something that you try to do every month? It could be something like getting together for a book club. It could be playing cards with friends. It could be exercise, going out for a walk, going out and getting some fresh air, going on a bike ride. It could be attending a, a group in your home or outside of your home. It could be a group at another, uh, a gardening group or a quilting group. I'm just trying to throw out ideas to generate things that you enjoy and things that are pleasurable. The next thing I want to do is talk about what are those limits that keep us from participating in recreation and travel. And four big topics I'd like to go over are time, energy, physical limitations, and personal fear or frustration. These are the four areas that I will talk a little bit more in depth about. And I want everybody to think about this because even though it may be the person who deals with MS who has these limits upon them, the family members involved with a person who has MS also has to think about these things because they may have additional responsibilities that keep them from participating in recreation or travel activities. And it, this is an, an important area of life for everybody. So my first slide here is just a little cartoon. I want everybody to think about managing those limits opens the door to possibilities. And as so many of us, we have this huge pile of things that we want to do. And we're going to get to it, we're going to get to it, but we haven't even, as the cartoon says, I haven't even had time to get the calendar. And this is my challenge to all of you, is somehow you need to find a way to stop. Maybe this seminar will help you stop for a moment, make the effort to get that calendar or whatever it takes so that you can start to manage the limits and therefore promote recreation and pleasurable activities in your lifestyle.
The first limit, time. Again, what you need to think about is have you reviewed your schedule? Have you actually sat down and looked at where your time goes and those things that seem to take up a lot of your time? Are there tasks that can be changed? Are there accommodations that can be made? Are there some activities that you could delegate to someone else to this time or once in a while or whenever they offer to help? Have you tried to make a plan? Have you thought about what ways you can make some accommodations to start to carve out some time for, for recreational activities? And most importantly, have you made recreation one of your priorities? So much of getting recreation into your life is making it a priority so that you can slowly carve out, find ways to make the time for it. Here, again, I wanted to just throw out a nice little cartoon because, as we all know, catching time is one very difficult thing to do. And I have one spider saying to the other, I just got tired of the same old thing, and so I bought fly paper instead of spending all that time making my web. A lot of times what it comes down to is we have to make change. In order to make time for those other activities that we want in our life, we might need to make a change. Managing time. As I said before, looking at your schedule, you want to try to organize. Are there things that can be combined, things that can be um, postponed? maybe just for a couple of days or maybe m instead of doing something every week, do it every two weeks. Um, look at ways to do things in a less consuming time. For instance, maybe shopping just at one store each week rather than two or three, um, even though the, the, there might be a better deal at another store if you can wait till the following week when you go there. Um, I'm just trying to come up with ideas for you to think about how you can maybe make some adjustments. Another idea might be pre-prepared meals or carry-out meals once a week, saving you time, saving you energy. A third idea I had was a service, the service that maybe picks up for you, a service that delivers for you. There's lots of services out there these days. There's services that bring food into your home. There's services that bring groceries to your home. I, I challenge all of you to take a little bit of time to go out there and look at some of those services and say, hmm, maybe once a month I can hire somebody to cut the lawn so my husband has more time or my support partner has more time for us to do something more pleasurable. Going on, if it's not time, is it energy? This is the next item that so often limits our ability to participate in recreational activities. Energy. Energy is limited. There's a limited amount of energy for every person. Every person needs to spend time thinking about what is their high energy and low energy times. Every person needs to think about what takes so much of my energy so that maybe I need to do the, re the things I want to do that would be enjoyable at a day when I'm not going to be so exhausted. So if I work on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, maybe Saturday is the better day to think about incorporating some recreational activities. Um, next is managing your energy. In order to find and conserve energy, we have to think about what we're doing. We need to plan, again, with the idea of combining activities or spreading things out so that you're not exhausted by the time you get home each day. Divide tasks into manageable steps. Maybe part of an activity, the grocery shopping gets done on one day and then you bit and prepare a huge meal on another day that maybe will last for several days. 
um, organize your activities to maximize your productivity. And then, as I have mentioned before, the idea that sometimes we need to modify or adapt to fit your needs. Remember, stress eats up your energy. So if you're running around trying to get something done, you're fighting yourself because your energy is wearing low, this is stress on your body, and this also consumes your energy. So this is my, why I keep saying you need to stop, think about what you're doing, plan, and organize, because if you're planning and organizing, hopefully you're reducing your stress level, and that will help you deal with your energy or your decreasing energy if you're having that busy day. Planning, planning is a key strategy to energy conservation. And when I refer to planning, I'm talking about maybe planning your day, um, remembering your highs and lows, doing things that are more energy consuming when you have more energy. For some people that's morning, for some people it's later in the evening or later in the afternoon. Plan your week so that you don't use all your energy up and then by Friday, which is the day you thought you were going to do something pleasurable and fun, you're too exhausted. Think ahead and make sure that you incorporate rest throughout your week so that the weekend is not just spent recuperating or running all the errands that you didn't do during the week. So again, planning is the key strategy. Plan for energy-consuming tasks for when you, you have someone with you or during your high-energy times. Again, something I had mentioned before about sharing or delegating, seeing if somebody can join you, um, off, if somebody offers to help you, let them offer um, and take them up on their offer. I also want to quickly refer you over. There, was another, there is another webinar that talks nothing um, completely about fatigue management. And while we're talking about energy conservation, that is part of the process of fatigue management. And so I just want to remind you that if that's a very important topic to you, you might also want to listen to that webinar. Okay, my next slide, I just wanted to give you some ideas um, on managing your energy. So I just threw out some things, um, adaptive equipment, things that you can have in the home, concepts, concepts such as sit. When you're sitting, you're actually conserving energy versus standing. Um, modify a task. Can you sit down to do it? Can you use some pre-prepared foods or something that gets rid of your need to um, prepare too much food. I gave an example here with a food processor, but another item might be a crock pot, something where you put your items into it in the morning, and when you come home, you've got the meal already cooked and ready. Um, I also showed the picture of the shirt, which is one of the services and obviously the cart that you see at the stores, which is the equipment. All these little things can add up to conserving your energy for things that you want to do, like recreation. The next topic I want to talk about is what about your physical limits? I want to acknowledge that we all have limits in our time, limits in our energy, and then there are physical limits. I think everybody um, might immediately assume, but you know, not only the, the person with MS, but the support partners, the, the family members who are helping also have to take all these things into um, consideration because if the support partner, partner is running around trying to do too much, they are then potentially going to add physical limits to themselves. And we want to acknowledge this and take that into consideration as we plan and try to conserve our energy and, and identify time to do things that are more pleasurable. And I, I will 
go back. I keep saying pleasurable, but when I talk about pleasurable, I'm also referring to our recreational activities and travel. I wanted to throw out there a couple beautiful pictures of recognizing that we all have physical limits in our strengths, in our energy. But remember, rather than letting it limit you, accommodate, adapt, and get back out there and be active. Adapting sometimes requires us to make accommodations. And here I just want to um, highlight a few minutes. Um, I want to recognize Jimmy Huga. Jimmy Huga was the founder of the Huga Center, now known as Can Do MS. He was an Olympic skier, and shortly after winning the bronze medal in the Olympics, he was told that he had MS. He was also told to just sit down and the disease would dictate his life. But Jimmy wasn't going to let that happen. He decided that was not going to be acceptable for him. And he set out to continue doing what he loved, and that was skiing. Along with that, he founded the center and explored how you could do things despite having MS. And so he took the idea of modifying, do what you need to do, but continue enjoying and being out there and active in life. And here you see him. He was in a sit-ski, but it was skiing. And for him, that was such a pleasurable activity that he just was never going to stop. And he continued doing that. Okay, getting back, I want to talk about physical limits. Physical limits is not about feeling embarrassed to use a walker or a scooter. It's about making the best use of your energy. Physical, abil physical limits, it's not about hiding your cane. It's about making sure you are steady and safe so that you can go on doing what you want to do. I also want to refer to, again to another webinar that is going to be purely on mobility and safety. And though I can't go into all the different walkers and scooters, and there's a lot of wonderful out equipment out there that can provide stability to you, which will make it easier for you to be mobile. And that mobility then gives you the freedom to be active. Adaptations for your mobility. I challenge all of you to explore the Internet. There are, thing, there are websites out there that talk about adaptive trails for hiking. These trails are often paved trails. These trails have um, railings on them in, in different areas to help the person who might need a little assistance. Um, there are lots of handicapped recreational sites that give you ideas of places, equipment, techniques. And again, I threw out a couple of pictures here. There is um, equipment that holds your fishing rod so you can still get out there and be fishing. There are places that you can go bowling. Just because you're in a wheelchair does not mean you can't be bowling. I don't have a picture, but I do want to um, suggest there is also what's called a cooling vest. A cooling vest is a vest that people wear where you put freezer packs in them, and it helps keep the core body temperature from overheating or getting too hot because when the core body temperature goes up, that's what helps bring on more fatigue. I don't have a picture of it. However, if you go to the National MS Society websites or if you Google cooling vest, you'll find lots of information. I'm not going to talk about any specific one because there are several good ones out there. Find solutions. The Internet has endless ideas for you to consider. There is even a website designed for people who have MS called uh, activemsers.org. This is a wonderful website where different people have written in, included pictures, shown how they have continued to participate in an enjoyable activity that they find, they have found. Um, 
there is also a recently I've been I uh, recently a website was identified to me um, by a person uh, named Robbie Pierce. He has MS. He's been in a wheelchair for years, but he has founded a website entitled Move Beyond the Disability. And he talks, he's very involved with sailing for people with disabilities. He has races, he has information. Again, another one of those websites out there that I think can provide specific details of maybe that, inter that activity that interests you most. Another thing I offer for solutions is support groups. The support group from your local uh, MS chapter, there might be a local um, group that does the activity you do, whether those people also have MS, but if they're involved in a quilting group, for instance, that's involved in an activity you really enjoy, making these friends and having somebody else to share with and join in to do things might keep you motivated and more involved. Um, I also suggest that you f jo find a friend to join you. Because a lot of times, the first time you try to do something, the first time you go to that water aerobics class at the pool, the first time you show up at the book club, you might feel a little intimidated. But if a friend joins you, it seems that it's not as intimidating. You can go, whether that person truly wants to continue or not, if nothing else, if they can help, as we say, break the ice and help you get, take that first step to get involved. The final topic I want to talk about, we talked about time, we talked about energy, we talked about physical limits, and the fourth one I want to highlight is fear and frustration that limits you. Sometimes we've had a bad experience, sometimes there's something that we really enjoyed and we can't do it any longer, and so we feel frustrated. I think we all need to take a moment and recognize those limits. Those limits may be allowing maybe influence our plans, that negative response of somebody, that frustration, that may keep us from trying it again. And yet sometimes I think recognizing that limit will then give us back the energy to try again. Because sometimes it doesn't work on the first time, but it may on the second or maybe even on the third. And so I encourage you to try to take that step again. Plan to do this with a family member or a friend so you have that emotional support because of maybe the anxiety of getting out there or the fear of going to the water aerobic class and it, it being more complicated. Go once and just observe. Sometimes that will help break the ice and then you'll realize it's not as difficult. It is something that you can enjoy and get involved in. Look for a group. Your local MS chapter may be having an activity. It might be having a support group. Maybe somebody in that group is also thinking about trying to get a bowling team together or a cooking group together or taking a class at the community college or the YMCA. These are all activities that you can get into that can bring you pleasure and enjoyment. It can be something that you and your support partner join. Um, it may be a cooking group or a gardening group or a lecture. Um, it could be something that you both find enjoyable, whether both of you are 100% into it or both just enjoy it, then that's something that you should consider getting involved in and making time for. And quickly, I just wanted to, again, re reiterate the idea that sometimes we have to recognize our fear but continue to take the challenge. I want to take a minute here and start to talk about travel. Travel, like recreation, can be part of your lifestyle. Having MS or your significant other who is dealing with MS does not mean travel does not need to be part of your lifestyle. And again, I threw out some pictures to stimulate some ideas. Using a scooter at a uh, 
airport to get you from place to place. Use um, When you call an airport and asking them to have the cart that moves you from one gate to the next, all these things are out there and available to you. You just need to plan ahead, think about it. Um, travel might be something you haven't done in a long time, but you want to get back out there. A cruise ship sometimes seems to be the perfect segue into being part of traveling again and that once you're on the boat you can learn to manage the boat will be accessible if you call ahead you make you check into which um, cruise lines are more accessible than others and most importantly as the third picture says get ready get set and go Travel. One of the keys to successful travel is planning and organizing. What part of travel is limiting to you? So you need to sit down and think, okay, what are the things I need to talk about? What are the things I need to make accommodations for? Do I need to call a hotel and make sure they have an accessible room? Uh, Do I need to call the airport and make sure that they have a cart ready to take me from one gate to the next? You don't want to push yourself to that limit so that you're in the midst of of traveling and you find yourself exhausted and almost missing your connecting flight. Think of these things ahead of time. When you call an airport or an airline and you let them know your needs, it smooths the way. It makes the travel more realistic. Remember, the energy conservation techniques that we started Um, talking about earlier where you need to think about your energy highs and lows. You need to realize how much you realistically can do. Maybe if it's a long, long distance traveling and you're going to drive there, maybe you need to drive or your significant other person is going to do the driving, but you're a passenger, maybe you need to break up that travel over a period of days so you can enjoy it and not be exhausted by sitting and getting stiff from being in the car or being thrown off schedule by too much time um, in the car. Think about those things and try to incorporate to make it an enjoyable event. I want to talk about travel resources. Again, the Internet can be our friend. There are lots of websites out there. Um, There are travel networks designed specifically for people with disabilities. They give you places. They rate these places. They talk about what what is good about them, how accessible they are, um, what equipment. It might be equipment that you didn't even think about, but maybe it's out there. I mean, if you go to the travel resource pages and you type in the particular type of travel, whether it be a cruise or a train ride, There's sites out there, there's organizations out there that address this. And just going through some of those sites might help bring ideas to mind for you so that your travel will become more accessible and more easy. Again, I'm going to go back to that activemsers.org website, which provides lots of ideas and ways to achieve those activities. I also found another website from a previous Can Do MS participant called ICanTravel.com. These sources are out there, available to you, and I challenge all of you to go out there and use those, explore those websites, whether it be the activity specifically you were thinking about or it generates a new activity in your mind. I also want to remind you that the National MS um, has a website that includes ideas on travel. And specifically, there are articles that talk about medications. I I don't want to go into that myself because every medication can be a little bit different. But if you go onto the National MS Society websites, there are actually physicians who address how to prepare, um, what medications need to be kept cold, how to keep medications going, what to do if you have an emergency and you need more medication. Those ideas and questions you might have are, are addressed on several of the sites under the National MS Society's um, website. And
then they also give ideas on how to manage those questions you have. Safety is a big issue, and so no, though you have questions, we also want to, on these websites, bring up the idea of safety. Safety for yourself, safety for the people that are traveling with you. And with that note, that leads me into possible equipment needs. Sometimes you, you might feel like you, you have the ability to walk that distance that you need as long as you take uh, rest breaks, or maybe you don't feel comfortable um, using a wheelchair. But if you pull back in the idea of safety, safety is so important because it makes it more realistic for you to be out there. It makes it a positive experience, and it gives you the if you move beyond the equipment and the thought of that equipment and move into the idea of safety and and being active, doing what you enjoy, that's what's important. Okay, the next thing I put up here is just possible um, outline of things to think about, questions to ask yourself when you're making a plan. And so I'd like to take a few minutes and actually go through this. Let's say uh, you've decided that your activity is going to be to get involved in a yoga class. It's not too high energy consuming. It could be very positive and rewarding. So you, the thing you might want to do is you might want to call the community college in your area. You might want to call the health clubs in your area. There are even yoga centers in some areas. Um, the YMCA, I'm just trying to throw out different places where you might find a yoga class that will accommodate you. And when I say accommodate you, I'm thinking of your uh, the time of day or the time of the day of the week that would best fit, fit your schedule. The next thing is when. So you look at those different places. Maybe you call some people, find out when there is classes and what time those classes are and what would work into your schedule. The next is where. So let's say you find one and it's being held at the local high school. So now you need to think about how easy is it for you to get there? How easy is it for you to get into that building? Um, will you be depending on somebody else for the driving? Or will you need to make arrangements um, to have a van pick you up and take you there and once you're there, you'll be okay? Um, or is there um, the temperature of the building and the temperature of the environment you're going to be in? Those are questions you might have, and you can call the, the place that is holding it, the group that is sponsoring it. Just questions and things that you should be asking. Next, you want to, are the steps, steps to prepare. And that is everything from as simple as calling to make sure that what you think you signed up for is what you signed up for. You might want to visit the building ahead of time to make sure you've looked at the, the setup of the room. Um, you've contacted the person who's offering the class and let them know that you might need um, a chair or a bigger table rather than one of these student desks. Or maybe you're coming um, and you might need to know where the bathrooms are and how easy it is for you to get to those. Another step might be to look at your transportation. Consider the time of day. Um, would, should you prepare the night before? Should you bring a drink to keep yourself cool or to keep your energy levels going? Obviously, cost and making sure that it's realistic for you and for your family. Clothing. What kind of shoes should you have? What kind of clothing should you wear? Do you have something comfortable that you can easily put on so that, uh, or shoes that you can just easily slip into so that you just don't have to be bothered with another obstacle that pops up? And then that leads right into possible obstacles. As we were talking about location and time, these could lead us to possible ob obstacles. 
so we need to think about sharing the driving with a friend or using another form of transportation. Are we, you know, you need to balance out whether the class you want that's closer is not at a good time of day, so maybe there's one at the YMCA, it's a little bit further, but it would work better in your schedule and your family schedule. Look at the physical challenge. Maybe it's a class where you'll go and you'll just plan on participating for the first half and then remembering to sit back and rest and not overdo yourself. These are all things that I want you to, to take into consideration because when you manage these obstacles, when you find a, work, a time that works for you, you find a location that works for you, you've talked to the teacher and you've shared your anxieties, it just helps remove those obstacles and makes it more realistic for you to participate. Okay, so that's my challenge to all of you, to sit and think of a plan, think of an activity. It can be something very simple or it can be more involved like joining the yoga class. But it's, if it's something that you think is going to be enjoyable, enjoyable for you, enjoyable for your family, it's something positive that everybody will um, enjoy and want to do again, then it's something you should make time for and, and try to plan for. In all, let's not forget our resources. The Internet has endless opportunities and ideas. Your friends might be a good resource. Your family a good resource. Maybe they can look and say, you know what, I know you really enjoy bowling, but maybe we could just, rather than getting involved in a weekly club where you have obligations every week to come, maybe we can just go once a month as a family or with some friends and do one of those activities that you enjoy. Look at your local and national MS chapters. Often they sponsor events, a one-day event, a weekend. Maybe they offer a water aerobics class through your local MS chapter that you might want to ex uh, explore. These are all things that some phone calls, um, some talking to people, and some reading, you can explore these resources and they won't consume your energy, but hopefully give you ideas that will, will energize you because you'll be thinking of something nice that you'll want to get involved in. So my challenge as I show these pictures are make recreation one of your priorities. Whether it be getting outside on a trail, whether it be joining a group and having some a water aerobic class, or maybe you're the extreme and you want to get out there and ski. The, the ability is out there. The equipment is out there. It's all there. You need to make time to explore and and you will find answers and hopefully find a way to get recreation and travel back into your life or increase the amount of recreation and travel that's in your life so it's more pleasurable and you're enjoying it more often. Oh. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Linda. Um, we have a ton of questions out there, and thank you guys, everyone, for submitting your questions. Um, you know, Linda, probably one of the major questions out there, though, is airline travel and how to um, how to deal with security and uh, all that sort of thing. So, do you have any, um, you know? a little more defined answers to um, getting through security a little easier and um, just making your airline travel uh, just a little more, um, you know, user-friendly, if you will. Um, I don't know that I have details in, you know, because every airport is a little bit different. Every um, airline, the airlines should handle things the 
in a consistent way, but again, every airport is so different. My suggestion is to get on the phone and call. Call the airport, call the airline and say, in Chicago, I am going to need special accommodations. What can they provide? And ask the question of them because every, every airport is from ADA is required to accommodate. And so you may need to allow more time. Um, you may, but along with that, by calling ahead, making sure you get the name of the person, giving them specifics, calling back the, the day before you're going to arrive and saying, okay, I called, I spoke with so-and-so, and he said that there would be a wheelchair and you would help me um, get through security so I don't stand in line for 45 minutes. You know, getting those details, getting names of people, getting ideas, um, I think those – that's the best way to manage an obstacle like uh, an airport because I, I do agree that can be a huge obstacle. Um, but planning and asking questions and seeing what they'll offer, you know, again, different airports can offer different things. And don't think, oh, I'm at this huge airport and they won't be able to do anything or that this airport is so small that they can't do anything. They all can make accommodations for you. And sometimes you have to just say, I need an accommodation and suggest something that you would like. And then if they can do it, or maybe that will challenge them to find a way to make sure they can do that for you. Great. Great. And I, I think that's uh very sound advice there. Um, uh, another big question out there, Linda, is uh, how do you deal with the heat when traveling? The heat when traveling, I guess a lot of it, um, you know, I, I did give the resource about the cooling vest, and I've had a lot of people say um, how they have been very helpful. The other thing would be to make sure you call ahead, you know, that the airline realizes you're not going to go on to a small little plane unless they have a the air conditioning on. And I would also suggest that you always keep cold water with you because when you give you add some cold water to yourself, um, you know, drinking it, that helps keep your temperature down. So you kind of have to plan ahead because then obviously if you're drinking more water, you need to know where those bathrooms are. But it all goes hand in hand in that it will then make you plan and you, and uh, allowing people to know that you need certain things to be done for you. You, know, you don't want to be on a small airline um airplane that then requires you to go outside and walk in where the heat outside is 100 degrees. I myself recently was on a plane where we had somebody who needed an accommodation and initially the plane landed and they were saying, oh, you're going to have to get down and walk across and then come back in. And it was just too hot outside. The person made it known. And within 10 minutes, the plane was moved to another location at the airport where we had one of those little um, sleeves come out, meet the plane, and everybody stayed within the air conditioning. So you, if you make your needs known, I think there are accommodations that can be put in place, but you do have to be verbal. Terrific. Yeah, just advocate for yourself, huh? Yes. Absolutely. Um, well, uh, Kind of moving along here, are there, um, are there any good stretching techniques for a long car trip? Um, I myself would want to say there's a lot of wonderful stretches, but the best stretch is really to make sure that maybe every hour you get out, out of the car, you get your legs straight, you walk a little bit, um, you move your arms up and down, um, and you, you even though you might need – you know, you're in a car, it's important that you get your legs in and out, stretch them. And when I say stretch, I don't mean, you know, stretch one leg out. I mean 10 reps with each leg and then with your arms, stand up, take some deep breaths, make sure you, you know, you fill your lungs with good air. Um, the important thing with when you do a lot of car traveling is you get stiff from being in one particular place. 
And I think it's so important that you remember, even if you just get outside of the car and stand there for three minutes, that will be a stretch, and that's, you know, that won't take away and add hours to the travel. It can really be as simple as a three-minute stand up, reach up, reach down, reach out, take some deep breaths. Great. Great. Okay? Yeah. Um, okay, and there's there's a lot of questions out there, uh, Linda, about international travel. And um, do, you, do you have any recommendations as far as uh, uh, anyone to contact for international travel for, uh, you know, to, to get out there and, and ask, um, ask for help? And are there organizations that can help you with that? Um, I do believe there are organizations. When you, tr when you Google or Bing or whatever search engine you use, um, as I explored the different websites for this particular talk, I did come across lots of different websites. My only uh, response back is I would check and double check your sources because just because one um, website said this was a wonderful place to go and and um, you'll find lots of accommodations. You might want to cross-reference that. Um, go to the National MS Society's website, and there are blogs on there where people talk about what they've been, what they've seen, what hasn't worked, and um, there's even websites that it may not um, necessarily be addressing a, a disability and accommodation you need, but there's websites like TripAdvisor where people will honestly say, well, this went wrong and that went wrong, and it will just give you things to think about because um, it, not every place is accessible, especially when you do international. And then there are some countries, um, the European countries, that are probably more accessible um, than you realized. And so I just um, – can't say enough about the resources uh, that are out there on the internet. And however, I do caution everybody to make sure you don't just look at one site, but then go to another site and kind of cross-reference that to make sure that it's consistent and that the information um, isn't being presented from one point of view only. Sure. That's great advice, and you know, um, there's some feedback coming from uh, some of our participants about how costly they can be too uh, to actually have somebody um, help you out. So, um, is there is there any recommendation on uh, you know um, fi finding something with with a um, limited budget? That uh, do you know of any websites or any companies that that? Uh, um. Again, you know, it depends on where you're looking and what you're looking at. Sure. Um, you know, it's kind of hard to be specific because uh, what accommodation you need or where you want to go when you travel, um, you know, I, and I do 100% agree the costs can go from minimal to astronomical, and you do have to keep that in mind. Um, Again, I would refer you back to the National MS Society where maybe they, d they don't have a specific um, a website dealing with what you want, but they might have a blog where you can write in and say, I'm thinking of traveling, I want to see this. And maybe other people who have also thought about that or have tried traveling to England or whatever might come back onto that blog and respond to you and give you ideas. And so by going to the National MS Society or their website, they can help you connect with people that you want to, um, who have had those experiences and, and maybe can firsthand share with you how they managed it, found reasonable accommodations. Sure, sure. Okay, uh, just a few more questions here. Um, let's see. How this is a great one. How do you or do you have any specific ideas um, how to get beyond the embarrassment uh, of using a cane or a wheelchair or any um, you know an adaptive tool? I, I think um, you know getting beyond that embarrassment is 
a challenge for a lot of people. And my challenge back to people is you have to think about yourself first. You need to think about your safety. You need to think about the safety of your family and friends who might be with you. And you need to understand what's the priority. The priority is getting out there, being involved. And you shouldn't let using or not using or having a wheelchair keep you from participating in things that are enjoyable. And you just have to, whether it's your own anxiety or the person that you think might be with you and doesn't want to be seen, you have to put it back out there and say, look, it's more important that I am active than whether there's a wheelchair next to me or not or a cane next to me or not. And I think taking that first step and saying, it's okay, I can do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to use a cane, is the first step is the hardest. And then after that, I, I, I hope that you will find the rewards much more gratifying than the embarrassment of taking that first step. Well said. Well said. Um Okay, just a couple of more uh, comments here. Uh, one person said um, TSA.gov has a lot of great info on um, meds and uh, security screening. So if folks uh, do have some questions about that, they can um, visit that website. Um, let's see. I would also else? think that yeah. the um, uh, pharmaceutical companies would be might have things on their websites that can give you ideas on how to manage medications when you travel. Yeah, that's a great idea too. And this question just came up in regards to uh, kind of having those embarrassed feelings about using adaptive gear. Uh, what if the caregiver or your support partner is the one who's embarrassed? How, how, do you have any recommendations for that, Linda? Um, I think when the support partner or the caregiver is the one who feels um, I think you need to verbally identify the positiveness instead of, I think we all want to associate a negative thing, like if I have a cane, then they'll know there's something wrong with me. You need to turn that around and say, it's not about the cane, it's about doing something. And I think if you go out there and make a true effort to look around, you'll find that there's lots of people using canes, using scooters, using wheelchairs. And I think everybody here will find that, you know, there's ever since they started putting the carts at the grocery store, they're more in use rather than not in use. And I've had people tell me where they've actually had to call and make sure that they're available because they're uh, so in use all the time. And so what I suggest is that you focus on the positive when you're talking about your caregiver or your support partner and saying, you know, it's safety and safety is the most important thing and then comes being involved. And we got to do whatever we have to do to make sure we go down those roads. We don't want to um, forget about safety and we do want to be involved. It's important. It's an important part to you. It's an important part to friendships and relationships. And so we have to move forward. It's sometimes making that change. Um, we have to just do it in small steps. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Well, um, I think that's going to cover all of our questions. What a fabulous presentation. And thank you so much, Linda. Um, a big You're thanks welcome. to all. Yeah, uh, big thanks to all the participants who joined in. And uh, the next Live Fully, Live Well webinar is on October 20th at 7 p.m. and 9 p.m. Eastern Time. The topic is Planning for the Future with Steve Neeson, who is Senior Director of Employment and Community Programs at the National Capital Chapter of the National Multiple Sclerosis uh, Society in Washington, D.C. And Sylvia Stasio, uh, who is also a uh, Certified Financial Planner you can register for this webinar on CanDo MS website, www.mscando.org. As soon as the presentation is over, you will see uh, a survey appear on your computer screen. Please take a moment to complete the survey and help us continue to improve our webinars. We value your feedback and your input. And thanks again.
this program is made possible by MS Active Source, which is sponsored by Biogen IDIC and Elan Pharmaceuticals. Thanks and have a great night, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude this evening's teleconference. I ask that you please disconnect your line, and we thank you for your participation. Awesome. Thank you.